Yeah, I think let's go ahead. I'll start the session, just cover a few housekeeping, welcome you all and pass over. Uh, meanwhile, we'll have enough time that you guys can join because we're all over 100 now. So good afternoon and hello everyone. Welcome to our session for lesson planning and delivery. Uh, lesson planning and delivery is indeed a crucial step towards creating a complete curriculum. And uh, this was actually a much requested webinar uh, that most of you requested in our last session. So we're here to support teachers with not only the content and the planning side of things, but what would be an effective way to deliver a, a lesson? So this session is going to be about a brief overview about the session is we're doing a model lesson so you can see how you can deliver the lesson in your class. Um, and just before we move on. Well, I'm, I'm your moderator for today, and with me I have my colleague Minerva. Uh, she and I are going to be in the background to support you. If you have any questions or any technical difficulties, just reach out to us in, in the Q&A box or the chat box, and we'll be able to help you out. Also, Jason Marshall is here with us. He's joining us from US. He's a senior curriculum consultant at McGraw-Hill. And Jason actually has done numerous workshops and, and training in, in schools in the United States and abroad. He does dynamic presentations, curriculum solutions, and technology training. I'm sure you, most of our audience might be familiar with him already. He's done a couple of Inspire Science sessions for us earlier. Thank you, Jason, for being here with us once again. Good to be with you as always. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to cover a few housekeeping slides before we begin. Although we're all very well versed with Zoom, but just want to make sure I'm not missing out anything. You have to make sure you're attended, you're connected to the audio once you log in and close down any high networking app like Netflix, YouTube, gaming platforms. Uh, we will cover Q&A &Q in the end of the session, but Equally, feel free to drop them in the chat box or the Q&A box. If you have any questions, you can let us know and we can cover it at the end of the session. Um, we will be providing the recording of this live session webinar to all our attendees. You will get this via email, by the way, and you will also get a certificate uh, if you've attended this live webinar. So you will get a certificate about a week's time, I would say, uh, in the same with the email address that you've registered for this session. <laughs> We do want to make sure this session is as interactive as possible. So make sure you interact with us, engage with us, uh, chat with the presenter through the chat box, and you can ask us questions, any technical queries in the Q&A box. We're more than happy to help you. We want to make sure you make the most out of this session. Um, just a quick note on your, your chat is currently set to all panelists and attendees or host and panelists, if you can just click on the drop down here and select everyone, then all your colleagues and peers can, can see your comments. I think people do want to make sure they're heard. So if you can just do that for me, then everyone else can see your comments and it's not going to only go to host and panelists. I am now going to quickly have a look at the chat box if you have any questions for me. Otherwise, I'm happy to pass over to Jason. Okay, I'll be in the background if you have any questions at all. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, over to you, Jason. Hey. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Suresh. Appreciate you uh, having us, uh, having me uh, join you today and, and to talk a little bit more about Inspire Science and to maybe and hopefully go a little bit deeper into Inspire Science. I know many of you have been using Inspire Science and it's a, it's a robust program. And I want to share with you maybe some things that, uh, some, some locations you haven't visited yet and some tools you haven't used and some planning suggestions you maybe haven't considered yet. Um, and uh, taking that direction, I'm also going to ask for your participation all along the way. As Sarish said, this is gonna be very important. And at the end, we're going to have a Kahoot. So many of you are familiar with Kahoot. If you're not, um, I will share with you the instructions at the end. It's basically an online quiz. And um, we're gonna do it for some prizes. So I've got some books here uh, from one of our authors, Paige Keeley. She's a former president of NSTA. She's a wildly successful author. I'm, I'm guessing some of you on this webinar 
have used her Uncovering Student Idea series. And these probes that are found in here uh, were the foundation of uh, something found in our program. We have a Paige Keeley probe experience found in our program. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit greater depth. But uh, some of these books for K through eight will be up for grab grabs as prizes. And I'm going to give you some hints along the way where I think you might want to pay attention for an answer that might be on the prize. Now, along the way, as we walk through a lesson, uh, I'm going to share things to consider, things that I've heard from Inspire Science users uh, from around the world, really, um, and, um, and things that you ought to look at when planning or differentiating instruction or to get students uh, engaged in argumentation or scientific discourse. And then next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have a time to chat feature. And what I've discovered in trainings like this is if I just do all the talking, it's the, the training is you know, moderately successful. I like to think that I'm pretty good at this, but it is a hundred times more successful if you share your experiences. That's where uh, best practices come out, what's been working for you. Uh, and when you share what's been working for you, you can help a colleague uh, in their classroom and you can get some benefit from their experiences. So it's good. We got a lot of people on this call. It's going to be real important that you are prepared to share along the way. And that will be a time to chat feature. What's been working with you? How do you use a probe? How do you use an assessment? What's a best practice when you um, use a virtual lab? Things like that. Just kind of be thinking of that along the way, because when it's time to chat, I want you to contribute in the chat. Really appreciate your contributions. Okay, now, just as a foundation for what we're going to talk about today, Inspire Science was built for the next generation science standards, and that means three-dimensional learning, and you've seen this color coding in our program. Now, you may not be a NGSS or 3D district, but integrating the science and engineering practices and cross-cutting concepts can enrich your curriculum anyway. And you've seen that color coding mainly in the teacher's edition, but a little bit in the student edition. So what's the big difference? Well, it's not a huge shift in instruction. It's not a completely different way of teaching, but these practices are a little bit unique. Many people uh, I found early on in the adoption of the three-dimensional learning uh, made the analogy, hey, these practices, they're the same as the, science, uh, the scientific method. I've been using the scientific method for years. It's the same thing. Well, not, not exactly. It's not exactly the same thing. And I'm very familiar with the scientific method. This was the first poster I put in my science classroom. I taught sixth grade science. This is the first thing on my wall, the scientific method. I think I had three of these posters. And they can, the scientific method can still exist in a science classroom, but the science and engineering practices take a little bit further. So you've noticed as a user of Inspire Science, the engineering integration, defining problems, designing solutions. This designing solutions is found in our STEM module projects where students are finding a creative solution to some sort of a problem or challenge. Okay, so that's a little bit different from the scientific method. We didn't see engineering in the scientific method. We have it in the science and engineering practice. And the other big difference that I want to highlight today is the engaging in argument from evidence. As a user of Inspire Science, you've probably uh, noticed that there's probably more opportunities to share out and have students uh, share their questions and their curiosities and things that they're thinking about along the way, more so than there are or in past programs. So because we were built for NGSS, you see more of these experiences in the program. And I'm sure you've noticed that by now. Uh, every single lesson and module begins with a phenomena. So what are phenomena? Scientific phenomena are occurrences in the natural and human-made world that can be observed and cause one to wonder and ask questions. Every module and lesson in Inspire Science, as you've noticed as a user, and we probably maybe have a few new users on here, Every module and lesson begins with a phenomena. Hint, hint, wink, wink. That may be a question on the quiz at the end. Every module and lesson. So we're going to go through uh, el the elementary and middle school programs. Uh, we're going to use a fourth grade uh, lesson as sort of the model, model lesson to walk through and kind of share thinking along the way. Not going to deliver it as if you were students, but we're going to walk through it and kind of share our experiences and best practices along the way. In middle school, Stay tuned, I'm gonna have some things that are specific to you, things like Learn Smart. We haven't gone into it in any great depth in any previous training, but let's, let's go into it a little bit greater depth today and how you can get students on Learn Smart to maximize your instruction. Uh, units are these four interactive student work texts. We call these units. 
they're broken down into one and two modules and the modules are broken down into lessons. And many of you have probably integrated the online experience as well, which we were gonna, which we were gonna dig into pretty deeply today. Um, these are available on any device, uh, anytime. So PC, laptop, Chromebook, tablet, and smartphone. And if you haven't started uh, getting students using their phone, let's, let's just say for a test or a quiz, uh, I think you're missing out on an opportunity. And I'm gonna share with you um, what a test looks like on a smartphone today. Uh, I'm gonna assign a test. I'm gonna take it on my smartphone. And you can see how it's, it's, it's optimized for that smartphone. So you can take a quiz pretty easily on it. And then you have these experiences. Now, a lot of Inspire Science teachers have asked me, you know, I don't see these experiences. Where, where are they found? Well, many of them are found within the ebook itself, the interactive student work text. They're embedded within there to make it a seamless experience. And we're going to talk more about that today as well. So we're going to cover a lot of ground. But let's, let's walk through a module. So here is the overarching module design. We start with a module opener. We go to a STEM module project. Every lesson uh, utilizes the 5E lesson model. And after every lesson, we make a little contribution to that STEM module project. We go into the next lesson, let's say lesson two. After that lesson, there will be contribution to that STEM module project. And at the end of all lessons, and there might be two, three, four lessons, there is that performance task that awaits us. It's called the STEM module project. So we're gonna use grade four, unit four as our model lesson walkthrough. Now, before I go into start a module, I need a plan for this module, right? I need to, to you know, get a feel for what experiences and the time considerations, the pacing involved with this module. So let's take a look at some tools to help you, uh, you know, as you're planning, okay? Many of you have maybe used some of these tools and maybe some of them you have not. So the first thing that I would wanna do is, uh, as a new user, is to go to my course view. And I want to go all the way to the top to program resources. So let's talk about pacing for just a second. How long is this module going to take? How long are the lessons going to take? Well, if I go to course view here and scroll down, I have a pacing for the entire program. Pacing inspires science, grade four. And here, uh, and by the way, anytime you see a new window like this, you may have not have noticed this, there's a handy little tool, open a new tab. It's a really handy tool in the program. So I can close out this tab. And now I have this tab up and running. And I use it, I use it constantly. So it's something you, you might want to start using uh, if you haven't already. And we see that the Inspire Science was built to support about 180 days of instruction. And every single module lasts about a month. Some shorter, like this one, Structures and Functions of Organelles, 18 days. Some a little bit longer, like this one, Natural Resources and the Environment, 31 days. But in all in all, for grade four, each module lasts about a month, some shorter, some a little bit longer, okay? So that's pacing for the entire program. But what about the module that I'm teaching uh, this month? Okay, let's go into that module. If I scroll down here to the module that we're gonna walk through, information processing and transfer, uh, I have a planning section for this module as well. It's one of my many file folders. And by the way, if you haven't uh, been on one of my trainings, I use the word file folders. And when I say file folders, I mean these horizontal lines. That's basically what the course view is. The course view is your digital filing cabinet. And when you open it, you're presented file folders. And in those file folders are your tools and your activities. So in my planning resources, I have a module at a glance. Let's take a look at it, okay? So I'm planning for this module and the module at a glance will give me a big picture view of the pacing. So here I have pacing for this module. We saw that every module lasts about a month, some a little bit shorter, some a little bit longer. Here we see that every lesson lasts about a week, some shorter, a little bit longer. So we say seven days for the uh, lesson one, lesson two. As we scroll through here, lesson three, last uh, seven days also, okay? So every module lasts about a month, every lesson lasts about a week. Well, let me, let me drill down even further here and take a look at a typical lesson in this module. If I go to the lesson level to see the pacing, I have a lesson at a glance. And I can take a look at how those seven days within this lesson are spent. It's saying with the Paige Keeley probe experience and the uh, encounter the phenomena engaged, 
That's the first day of instruction. So these two activities are a day of instruction. The lab and explore this inquiry activity, that's day two. And then explain is gonna take about three days. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna learn these topics on these days. And then down here in elaborate, that's day six and evaluate is day seven. So seven days total of instruction. And there are pacing for the course, the module and the lesson level which, which, which we've just seen. Now, the next thing I'd wanna do when planning for this particular uh, uh, module and lesson so I probably want to sneak a peek at the teacher's edition, right? To see what, what tools are available there. Well, let's, let's do that. So I'm going to sneak a peek at the teacher's edition and I'm going to open this window up by using this, uh, this tool right here. So I can close this out and I'm going to keep the teacher edition uh, up and running just in case we want to refer back to it. And so every module will begin with this two page spread. And if you're a uh, NGSS classroom or do 3D instruction, this may mean something to you or you see the uh, three dimensions that will be addressed in this module and the performance expectations over here, color-coded. What do I mean by color-coded? We've unpacked, visually unpacked, the specific skills that students are going to be uh, learning about in this particular module, the specific content in orange, and the specific themes in green. If I fast forward through this, let me go through a couple of these. Here's that module planner. We found it in that print PDF uh, that we just looked at a little bit ago. It's also in the teacher's edition for planning purposes. Okay, so I'm gonna take a look at that. And then for those labs, I want additional uh, pacing and planning uh, support. So there's this inquiry planner. Every single lab in this module is listed. Next to the lab is how much time is just suggested it might take. And as you know, every veteran teacher on this call knows uh, pacing is just a suggestion. Uh, your lessons might take a little bit longer. Your module may take a little bit longer. You may go through that module a lot faster than we have outlined. So when we're talking about pacing, it's, it's sort of a model pacing, and that will change depending upon how, what resources you choose to use and not use. It's just a guide. It's just a suggestion. It's not written in stone. So this hands-on experience, I could extend it a number of ways to last much more than 30 minutes if I so choose. It's gonna tell me uh, suggested groupings, small groups or whole group, and then consumable resources used, okay? Uh, and non-consumable. If I go to the next page, it tells me I have two lab uh, videos that support me for each and every lab. And we're gonna take a closer look at these here in a little bit. So uh, many elementary teachers are not uh, science specialists. You may be literacy specialists. You may be math specialists, or you just may be generalists. And labs, lab day can be a terrifying experience if you're not fully supported. So these, these lab experiences are going to be really integral to your success uh, when you enter lab day. We're going to take a look at these, but they're listed right here in the teacher's edition. Okay. And if I go to the next page, and by the way, all these pages are precede every single module in Inspire Science. So when you enter a new module, you get all of these pages to look at, to prepare for, uh, for what's coming, to be successful in that module. And then so when we differentiate instruction, we've got a couple pages here as well. This code uh, in orange AL are tips, strategies, and suggestions for students approaching level. And by the way, we just don't see them at the beginning of the module, we'll see them throughout the lesson. This little blue icon that says OL, that's for students on level. That's, that's just about every student, the average student in your classroom. And then this BL, it's for students beyond level. As I scroll down here, I have other tips and suggestions for integration, including these leveled readers, okay? The following page is, is English language support. Now, I feel it's been my experience that this English language support is an underutilized tool. A lot of teachers say, well, I'm not really an EL, EL teacher, or I, I don't need real, re, don't really need EL support in my, my classroom. Uh, but what you'll find is if you take a close look at these, is that these EL support pages are great tips and strategies and activities for all students, especially students that are struggling in your classroom. They tend to make the content a little bit more concrete, a little bit more visual, sometimes a little bit more kinesthetic and hands-on. Um, and you know, so when you start reading these, you go, you know what, I overlooked that, but I'm gonna use that for my entire class. And this EL support, just like the approaching level, on level, and beyond level, 
extends beyond this module opener into every single lesson of Inspire Science. So, you can, so you'll continue to see these. EL support will be in purple boxes, and you'll see these differentiated support in blue boxes. Now, some of this you guys have already discovered, but I think it's important to start out as a foundation. So let, let, me, uh, let me move back here into my PowerPoint, and we'll come back to this teacher's edition as we're walking through this lesson and we're planning for this lesson. Okay. So the unit that I'm going to walk through is grade four, unit four. Okay. It's information processing and transfer. This is all about how humans communicate, how animals communicate, and is it possible there are simil similarities between uh, how humans and animals communicate and, pr and process information? So there's a couple things to consider when you're going into the module opener. The module at a glance, we took a look at that already. The teacher's edition, <clears throat> we took a look at that already. We kind of saw the uh, module support going into this module, the teacher's edition uh, resources. But there's a couple of resources here we haven't seen yet. And sometimes they go overlooked uh, in new users. The storyline and remote instruction options. So, so let's take a look at those two tools. Okay, where are those found? Um, so if I go back to my course view and I go into a module and I go back into that folder titled module planning resources, here's that module in a glance we looked at just a little bit ago. If I scroll down, I have this thing called the storyline. Now the storyline is essentially a pathway for students uh, to understand and to figure out phenomena over time. It's a pathway. It's the pathway that will be used in this module. So let's take a look at what students are conceptually are going to be encountering in this module, okay? The big idea of this module is to help students understand how animals, including humans, transmit and interpret information. Students will explore the question, how does a lighthouse transmit a message across the distance, okay? And so it says, um, we're just reading it together here. As students observe each investigation level phenomena, they will gather pieces of the puzzle to solve and explain the anchoring phenomena, okay? So then it goes on to break down the phenomena for each module and lesson. So here's the module opening phenomenon. Lighthouses transmit a message using signals from a system of lenses that produce a distinctive flash signal. Modern lighthouses also use the coded pattern of its radio signals to provide mariners with information. Similar to a lighthouse, a sonar can be used to use, uh, uh, a sonar can use sound to send information. In this phenomena video, students will uh, gather information how dolphins, dolphins use echo uh, location to communicate with one another. Okay, and then it goes on from lesson to lesson to kind of give you a big picture of what students are learning along the way and the solution they're figuring out at the end. So it's a big picture narrative of the pathway, the conceptual pathway students are taking in this module. This is important just to take a glance at, especially if you're not as comfortable with science as maybe some of the other science specialists. Just take, take a look at that phenomena, uh, that lesson at a glance. So we've, or that storyline. The other thing is this remote instruction options. Many of you uh, might be teaching, oh, before I take a look at that, let me backtrack. That uh, storyline is often uh, mirrored in the teacher's edition. So if we're in the teacher's edition and we're about to enter this module, I tend to have this teacher toolbox, which I find is an, an also often underutilized tool for teachers. And here it says science background. And it go, talks about lighthouses again. And it talks about dolphins again. And so this is this toolbox, never ignore it. Look at it when, it when it appears always. Now, sometimes the toolbox will have fun facts that uh, might extend a lesson. But a lot of times, it's going to give you foundational uh, confidence when you enter a module and lesson. Okay. So the other tool that I mentioned here is the remote instruction options. Many of us may still be teaching remotely. And if not, you may uh, have some best practices that you want to extend. So for instance, what I'm finding is a lot of teachers uh, started teaching a different way and they wanna continue teaching that way because some of the strategies and activities that they were doing were working, okay? So maybe some online homework, maybe some online activities, things that students can do at home. Well, let's continue that instruction with this planning instruction in different learning environments. 
Okay, this is a fairly new tool. In fact, you may not have noticed it. It was built uh, during this past year of the pandemic to help students uh, deal with remote learning situations. And so uh, I'm not gonna go into all of this, but as I scroll down here, this gives you best practices. And I'm gonna open this up in another window as well, just to make it a little bit larger. Uh, best practices for remote learning environment. So as you're walking through this lesson, it's gonna tell you, hey, this, this is what you might do synchronously. And this is what you might do asynchronously for the Paige Keeley probe uh, activity. And this is what you might do for the engage activity. Students watch the video, look at the photos. This is what you might do synchronously. And this is what you might do synchronously, asynchronously. So however you wanna teach this, whether it be synchronously or asynchronously, we're giving you a strategy for implementing this lesson. And for some days, and the suggestion I might give you, uh, for instance, for this probe, is assign it for students to do at home uh, when we're not together so that class time can be maximized and you have more time to free up. So do not ignore this. I think you're going to find a lot of strategy that will help you in your classroom. Free up time for inquiry and activities by having students do some of these activities remotely. And this gives you a very prescriptive pathway to do it, okay? It really makes it um, just, uh, just foolproof, really foolproof. Our development team did a really nice job on this piece. Where did I find it? Well, right here on my dashboard screen for grade four, down here, planning instruction in a uh, different learning environments, okay? So um, I have some other strategies here that we're gonna come back to. So these are the first things that I would do before we go into a module. We've seen quite a bit, right? We've seen the pacing for the entire program. We've seen the module at a glance, the lesson at a glance. We took a look at the storyline, the teacher's edition. And we're also in the back of our mind thinking, okay, what might I use asynchronously in a remote teaching environment? And this, these are all the things that I would want to do as a teacher for planning, pacing, and potentially differentiating instruction going into the lesson. So now we're at this, forgive my dog here. I have him, uh, I have him in the bedroom, but I can still hear him and you might be able to as well. But um, here's my two page module opener. And uh, it's for grade four module, uh, unit four. And uh, it's information processing and transfer. Remember, this is how humans communicate, how animals communicate, and can we make connections between how humans and animals communicate? And it says, how does a lighthouse transmit a message across the distance? Uh, it says, go online, check out clicks and echoes to see this phenomena in action. Remember, every module and lesson begins with a phenomena. And so where do I find that phenomenon in the program? How do I project it to my class or assign it to my class to do asynchronously and then come back and review? Well, I go to my course view. I go to that module that I want to, uh, that we're in, information processing and transfer. Here we are. And there's two ways I could project, use that module uh, opener phenomenon. I could go to my module opener these folders are organized just like the student edition is. So if we're in the module opener of the student edition, I'm gonna see that and, and that video is listed. That's exactly where I'm gonna see it in my file folders, module opener. And I could open it up this way. Again, open this up in another tab uh, is probably what I would do. And then I could play that video, here it is. But what I would suggest that you do and to start using is this launch presentation feature. And I'm finding this is an underutilized feature when doing a lesson as well. This has all of those interactives embedded within it already. And it's a, an experience that you can edit. So if I launch it here, and again, um, I could open this up in another window, but I'll keep it right here. I have uh, a, an experience that mirrors my student edition. The presentation tool is essentially a cover to cover presentation of your student edition in a presentation format. But unlike your student edition, those videos referenced are videos available to you. So here's that clicks and echoes video. And so let's take a look at it. And so this is a 3D video. Not all of the phenomena are 3D, but this one happens to be. And we hear something communicating. Now I look down and I see dolphins. So dolphins are communicating to each other. So dolphins must have a language, I guess. 
And if they have a language, does that mean they have an alphabet? Do all dolphins speak the same language? Does a dolphin in the Indian Ocean speak the same language as a dolphin in the Pacific Ocean? How, how do they perceive their language? Do they have ears? Uh, I don't see ears on that dolphin. What, what, do they have a brain that that, that, a, that information goes to? What's going on here that we have dolphins communicating and I'm assuming understanding each other in this phenomenon, okay? So the phenomena is designed to spark curiosity and student-generated questions. Every good phenomena should do that. And so I'm gonna close this phenomena out. So we've taken a look at it. Every module begins with a phenomenon. So the idea after phenomena and, and to maximize an Inspire Science lesson is get students to talk and to share their ideas. Now, there is, there is guidance for doing that in a teacher's edition. So if I go to the teacher's edition here, I'm gonna see some strategies to get students to talk about it. So here we are in that teacher's edition, and here we have a talk about it feature. That's one thing to do, uh, and to utilize. I can also create a driving question storyboard or assign a pretest to get an idea of what students are thinking going into this module. So what is a driving question storyboard? Well, let's take a look at it. This is a tool being used uh, around the world when it's a phenomenon-based lesson, like ours are. Ours are phenomena-based lessons. What do I mean by phenomena? Basically, we're, at, we're answering questions over time. So in this particular one, this, is not, this, is, this isn't a board from this particular module. It just happens to be one I saw in a classroom and I took a picture of. Um, how can we smell things from a distance? How can I smell things from a distance? So that's the big question. And each lesson along the way has a smaller question. This is organized just like Inspire Science, where you can post a big question and some smaller questions. And, in, and maybe instead of having students share their questions uh, and raise their hand to share their questions, maybe a little less intimidating is for them to write those questions on a sticky note. And they write their little questions on a sticky note, questions that they have along the way, right underneath here, and they post them. And so now the teacher can see them and we can start answering these questions over time. Get all our questions that we have, all our curiosities, all the things that we're thinking about uh, related to these questions on this driving question storyboard. And we can revisit them over time. The idea of sharing our thinking, sharing our questions, and revisiting our questions over time is an academic design foundational element of Inspire Science. So this is just one tool that might help you express that, and maximize that, this driving question storyboard. It's a vehicle that you might use. It can also be done uh, remotely. So maybe instead of a physical driving question storyboard, you use a Padlet like this one, where students are sharing their ideas in this driving question storyboard Padlet or other sharing tool. Uh, so these are just some best practices. And there's a pretest that I could assign as well. So um, if I want to get an idea of what students are thinking, I might go to the pretest. So um, I might have popped out of Inspire Science. Let me go back into it. I accidentally closed my window. Let's go back into my class, grade four. And so uh, if you wanna do a diagnostic test to get an idea of what students are thinking on core ideas, every single module uh, has a pretest. So if I wanna come down here, to a module instead of the planning tools, which we just looked, I can go to module opener. And as part of this module opener, I have a pretest. I could print it out right here and make copies, but that's what I wanna do. Light is a form of energy that, and just get an idea of what students are thinking from a test that I could print out and make copies, or I could assign this remotely and have students do this digitally. Now, the benefit of them doing it digitally is that it gets scored for me automatically and I can generate reports to see how they're doing. So while we're here, I might as well assign this. I'm just gonna assign it just in case we have some folks that haven't assigned too much uh, digitally. I'm gonna assign this digitally. I'm going to give a due date of the 29th. I'm going to give, uh, I want this to go to all of my grade four classes. So in, right here under copy classes, I'm gonna click select all. You might have a period two, a period three, a period four, and you want all of your grades uh, periods to have this assignment, not just one. I wouldn't want to assign something five different times. I want to assign it once and have it go out to all of my periods. 
So I'm always going to click this select all. I only have one additional class, so uh, that's all I see here, but I'm going to click select all. And I'm going to click assign. And now that has been sent out to my class. Okay. So we've seen quite a bit of tools going into the module. The pacing for the entire program, the module at a glance, which shows us pacing for the module. We took a look at lesson at a glance. Even though we're not at the lesson level, I wanted to sneak a peek at it to see how a lesson will flow. We took a look at the storyline. Um, and we're going to take a look at the essential planning guide in just a little bit. So my question to you is, What's your best practice you've discovered when introducing phenomena at the beginning of the module? Okay, what, what have you discovered? How do you get your students to share their ideas? Uh, go ahead and share a best practice or tip in chat. How do you get students to share their ideas? Because that's the key of the module phenomena. Go ahead and uh, put it in the chat if you don't mind. Do you group your students a certain way? Do you have questions on the board? Do you, do you have a, a strategy that you'd like to share with the group? How do you get students to share their thinking with module phenomena? Go ahead and utilize the chat. Uh, Murfini, okay, I, I give my student. Uh, tell me a little bit more. What do you, what do you give your student? What, what do you give your student? Uh, any, any more of the chat? How do you get your students to share their ideas of what they think is going on? when you introduce a phenomena. Uh, great topic on Google Class. And ask my students to reply. Excellent. I could. This is perfect for Google Classroom, isn't it? Show a video and ask the qu students questions, what they understand about it. Brainstorming questions. Um, in the resources, it will be there for every lesson. Very, bell activity. This is a great bell activity. Absolutely. Uh, videos about phenomena. I use a Padlet as well. Thank you, Yasmin. Padlets are great for the phenomena. Let them watch a video. And the nice thing about the Padlets is that it's a little bit less threatening, right? Instead of students raising their hand and they're worried about it, asking a dumb question, you know, most students are, have them post it on the Padlet at home. Share students' ideas for science entry. Doodle, iPad, I love that, Sharina. Uh, thank you for sharing that. The Doodle Pad, excellent. I put my students in groups and have a group leader. That is an awesome idea. I didn't get, catch your name, but thank you for sharing that. My chat is going so fast, sorry. I'm, I'm thank you, I, I, that's, that's, that's great because you're sharing your thinking here. And um, okay, now I've got it expanded to the a bigger view. I see Nearpod is a great source for collaboration. Uh, my students are grouped and with mixed abilities. I love grouping students with mixed abilities. Thank you, Meyer. I think that's a wonderful best practice. Uh, ask them what comes to mind when they hear the word phenomena, love it. Think, pair, share, and they're aimed very excellent. It's a time honored, uh, successful best practice. High order thinking, uh, quizzes on the same topic. I love it. Thank you all for your contributions. Hopefully, you got, let me scroll up to make sure I didn't miss anything that I want to elaborate on. Probe questions, excellent. Love it. Uh, let them watch video, excellent. Thank you all for sharing. Okay. Lots of best practice when we want them to share ideas. And by the way, I've got some links here in this PowerPoint, and you're going to get this PowerPoint as a follow-up. And in this PowerPoint at the end, I've, I'm going to have a packet, basically. And one of the links in this PowerPoint will take you to um, a site that shares best practices when you're getting students to engage in scientific discourse. So how do we get students talking more in our classroom? That's essential for Inspire Science. How do you get them sharing ideas and their curiosity? How do we group them? Uh, what tools do we use? And I think you're going to really like this link. It's good. I, I've, I've seen tons of best practices on it. So let's continue. So we're at the module phenomena. What's next? The STEM module project launch. This is an introduction into the STEM module project that awaits. They come in two types, science challenges or engineering challenges. They're found in grades two through eight. Kindergarten and first grade, as you know, you have a slightly different feature here, which I'm talking, going to talk about in just a little bit. Science challenges are often a research project of some kind. Okay? Engineering challenges, students are actually going to design something and engineer something, a solution to a problem. So what's their design here for this particular uh, module that we're walking to? You're being hired as a telecommunications engineer. 
It will be your job to build a device that, to send a message across a classroom. Okay. And it goes on to say that device is going to have to use either light or sound to do that. Okay. So now this is going to give a little bit more context to everything that follows. When I was teaching, I used to call this a hook to hang things on, right? Just kind of a little bit more scaffolding. Now I'm thinking in the back of the mind what the end goal is in mind. And that's the idea of the STEM module project launch. Now, I always like to show, tell teachers in my trainings, I, I always like to give teachers permission not to use a feature because sometimes, you know, features that are designed by a publisher or, or program can be, you know, um, uh, what's the word I want to use? Um, constraining or, you know, you, might, you just might, may feel as though you just don't have time to do it or can't do it for some reason. So think of the STEM module project as something our academic design team has integrated within Inspire Science as part of its design. But if you don't think you have time for the STEM module project, if you have another STEM project, STEM project in mind that's worked well for you over the years for information processing and transfer, feel free to use it. It's, you know, you can use it too. So as we go along the way through this model lesson, uh, think of, of um, ways you might augment this lesson and always know that you can integrate resources that have used, you've used in the past successfully. So I said that that's, that STEM module project launch for, is for grades two through five, and that kindergarten first grade at the beginning of a module have something a little bit different. So here we have in ki uh, kindergarten first grade. What you all see, as you've discovered, is a STEM career con uh, connection. We didn't feel as though kindergarten and first grade students would benefit from a STEM module project launch. So just from a uh, developmental standpoint, you have a feature that's more appropriate, a STEM career connection. Like what does a park ranger do? And what does a landscape architect do? Again, we're connecting into STEM, we're connected to a STEM career, but it's not a STEM module project feature. These STEM career kids that you see highlighted here, like here, go online and see the landscape architect, go online and see uh, the park ranger. They are found in video format online. So you can play a video of this park ranger sharing uh, their ideas. And I'll go back online in a little bit. If you don't know where these are, I'll show you where these STEM career kids are. They're just incredibly cute avatars that share their passion about a STEM career. After that STEM career connection, kindergarten, first grade teachers, you have the word wall. It's a, word wall. It's a vocabulary activity. These are the vocabulary words that students are going to see in this module. So where do we enter now? Now we're entering the lesson. Everything we've seen so far is module opener feature stuff. It's module opener content. Uh, it's not a lesson content. So everything we've seen so far uh, is when we look online is stuff that exists here at the module level. So if I click on this module folder, that's all this stuff. Okay, this from an organizational, organizational standpoint online, module planning going into the module, Module opener, that's where that phenomena was. This is where the pretest was. Uh, and here's a STEM module project. And here's that launch we just took a look at, okay? The digital form of this. And so if you're still teaching remotely and that STEM module project launch is something, you know what, you just might assign it as a homework assignment, just so students read it. Uh, we don't need to spend any valuable class time going over the STEM module project launch in class. You might want to assign this digitally. Have students read it at home and then say, hey, when you come in to class tomorrow, let's just go ahead and assign this while we're here. Uh, I'm going to say, read. When you come into class tomorrow, I want you to be able to tell me what you are design the module, you know, or just whatever question, just to ensure they read it, just to make sure they understood it. I'm going to give them a task. They're going to, they're going to have to come in tomorrow to be able to tell me what that was all about, and what their design is going to be about. And I'm going to click assign. Now that's been sent to my class, but everything that precedes the module and everything found at the end of the module is organized online in these module resources. Okay, so if I close out these folders, I have to click on module, 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 wherever I see a module, these will give me file folders that will support me at the beginning of the module, 
and at the end of the module. And that's all we've seen so far. But now we're about to walk it through a lesson, aren't we? We're gonna plan for this lesson. Now, we saw when I'm planning for this lesson specifically, I'm gonna go into lesson two here. As a teacher for planning, I probably wanna take another look at this planning resources here. And I might wanna take a look at this lesson at a glance here. So when I'm planning for this lesson, I just wanna take a look at this, okay? This is the full track. If you teach 45 minutes a day, it's gonna take me about seven days, okay? This phenomena that I'm about to do today, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna take me about half a day. Uh, so I can get a big picture view of how this lesson should proceed. But we know not every elementary classroom teaches the same way, okay? You might teach science 30 minutes a day. You might teach 30 minutes three times a week. So for you, we have alternative pathways. We call those flex tracks, okay? So uh, it condenses that lesson. So here we have that pathway as well. And by the way, this lesson at a glance is also found in the teacher's edition, okay? It's also found in the teacher's edition as, as many of you have probably discovered. So consider this alternative tract as well. Now, while I'm here planning for this lesson and the pacing, I might wanna also look at a new tool that McGraw-Hill has developed for uh, a condensed lesson plan. It's called the Essential Planning Guide. And you may not have even seen it yet, possibly. If I go to my uh, course resources here. Let me go to my course. And let me go to course resources or program resources. And if I scroll down here, I have something called an essential planning guide. Let me open it up. If you adopted a year or two ago, you didn't see this at first. So you may not have noticed this yet. So what is this tool? Let's take a look at it. I'm opening it up in another window. By the way, if you haven't started doing this, you'll probably start doing this immediately. I do it for almost every resource I open it up, I open it up in another window so I can have it available to me. So what does this essential planning guide say? Here it explains it. It's a lesson plan designed for teachers who are looking to make the most out of limited science instructional time. This lesson plan uses only 60 minutes of science time every week, but will still ensure that the entire Inspire Science NGSS-based curriculum can be taught with an allocated number of instructional days. In some cases, specifically grades four and five, additional reading time may be needed so students uh, are able to learn and apply the information necessary to meet the NGSS standards. Each lesson spans two weeks and is designed using the 5E lesson model. And what I kind of like about this tool here, and you can decide if this is a tool that will work for you as well, and this may, may or may not work for you, but just know it's available to you. Take a good look at it and see if this pacing is appropriate for your classroom. And it may be a really good tool for you. Or you might say, you know, I don't think this is quite right for my fourth grade classroom. So here we have week one of instruction, 10 minutes on the module overview. That was that um, uh, lighthouse and dolphins activity. Then we're gonna get into engage in the lesson, explore, it's gonna take 15 minutes, explore is gonna take 10 to 15 minutes. And then we're gonna get to the rest of the 5E lesson model in week two. And what it does after that, is it breaks down exactly uh, how that will work, okay? What you should do, project the module phenomena photo of the roller coaster and check out the phenomena video, okay? If you have a little extra time, go into the pro. So it gives you a little bit more of a visual presentation of that lesson. And re But remember, this is a condensed lesson. Not every McGraw-Hill Inspire Science resource is brought to bear here. There are some that are omitted in this condensed lesson. It's designed for teachers that have told us, um, you know what, I just don't have as much time to te teach science. Our focus in our district is literacy and math. So we just don't spend too much that much time on, on science. So that's what this essential planning guide is designed for help you with the pacing and the planning of that condensed instruction, okay? So we're gonna start with a probe, okay? And by the way, Paige Keeley, we, former president of NSTA, and these are an activity designed to spark curiosity and to uncover, mis basically not spark curiosity, uncover misconceptions and get students talking prior to the lesson. So in this particular lesson, we're gonna take a look at one called Animalize, okay? Uh, 
But before we go to this one, I'm going to share one that's not in this lesson. And I'm going to have you share your thinking in the chat on what this, this phenomena is, okay? What the answer to this phenomena is. So if you haven't used probes yet, uh, probe is a scenario that you have to consider. and You have to decide who do you agree with most and why to explain your thinking. Who do you agree with most? And there's this last part, why? So I'm going to share with a probe. It's not in Inspire Science. So you haven't seen this probe yet. So I want to get your ideas on this. The students in Ms. Barto Mrs. Bartoli's class were studying how chickens develop from an egg. The students put a dozen freshly laid fertilized chicken eggs in an incubator. They wondered what would happen to the weight of an egg as the chick developed inside. This is what the students thought. So here's the scenario. We're gonna weigh an egg right after it's laid, right after it's laid from the chicken. We're gonna let it incubate. And then we're gonna weigh that egg right before it pecks out of this egg, just like you can see here. So what's gonna to happen to the weight of the egg over that time? Sarah says, I think the egg will weigh the most right after it is laid. Rodney says, I think the egg will weigh the most right before it hatches. Hakeem says, I think the weight of the egg will stay the same after it's laid and before it hatches. So Hakeem thinks there'll be no change in the weight of the egg. In the chat, I'd like for you to share with me what you, who do you agree with most and why? Do you agree with Sarah, Rodney, or Hakeem? Let's go ahead and share our thinking in the chat. Who do you agree with most in this probe? Sarah, Rodney, or Hakeem? Sarah, Rodney, or Hakeem? Who do you agree with most here? Let me close my window out. Let's go and see that. Here we go. Rodney, okay. Rodney, Sanja Blitz Rodney, Malik Rodney, so that you think the egg will weigh the most right before it hatches. Okay, very good. Phelan says Rodney, okay. Who else do we have here? Uh, we have Lauren. Okay, so Lauren put an explanation too. I think this chick would have developed. Okay, very good, Lauren. I didn't ask for an explanation, but I'm glad you shared one. Uh, I'm gonna ask for an explanation here in a little bit, but just put the name that you think for now. Got a lot of Rodney here. I think the egg will weigh the most right before it hatches. Uh, Tabasum, thank you, great inquiry-based teaching. I love it. It is. You're absolutely right. So it's curious. I bet you kind of. I bet you all are curious. I bet you you're a little bit unsure what the best answer is. Now, even though many of you are putting Rodney, Reina, thank you, very good. Rabab, and, and forgive me if I mispronounce uh, the words. I, I I apologize. Our names, I should say. Samari, Rodney. Okay, I've got a lot of Rodney. No Sarahs yet. And no Hakeems. Anybody else? We got uh, Nadine, Rodney. Okay, very good. So we got a lot of Rodney on this scenario. When will the what will the egg weigh the most? Right after it's laid, or right before it hatches? So this is a probe I use sometimes in trainings. Okay, uh, one because it's outside of the Inspire Science program, and I and I know uh, I know teachers you know haven't seen this yet, so that's that's one of the reasons I use it. And one, it's just kind of a curious question, right? It's, you know, you, I wonder when, because there's some, there's some science going on here, you know? You, there's things to think about and to consider. And so this is what probes are designed to do for your students, is to get students to think about this explanation. Now, here's what I'd like for you to do next. Those of you that have responded, thank you very much. Why do you think Rodney? I didn't see any Sarah or Keynes. Why do you think, uh, why do you think Rodney? Why do you think it's going to weigh the most right before it hatches? Go ahead and share with me in the chat. Why do you think it's going to weigh the most right before it hatches? What's your explanation? I'll give you a moment to do this because the explanation is so very important when it comes to the probe. Why is it going to weigh the most right before it? Akim, amount of matter remains the same. So I do have an Akim here. The amount of matter will remain the same. Full body structure. Okay, Samara says there's a full body structure now. Uh, none because it will be lighter in order to hatch. Okay, 
Halal put none because it will be lighter in order to hatch. Well, I think that might have been, I think you may have said Sarah then, if that's what your answer is, but, but maybe I'm interpreting that wrong. It will weigh the same Hakim because nothing is going into the egg. Okay, interesting. Because after it will, uh, it uh, hatches, builds fluids, which will be lost. Okay, uh, okay, the fact there's growth and the chick develops. Theodore, thank you for that. So Theodore thinks that the chick is developing. I'm going to put words in your mouth, Theodore. So I'm assuming you're thinking, you know, it's developing some feathers and some bones and, and some muscles that it maybe didn't have before. Okay. So, uh, uh, so we have, uh, we've got some answers here. Very good. Chick muscle developed. Okay, very good. We've got some answers being put there. Now, probes are designed to spark curiosity and student-generated questions. And I'm sure you're kind of curious, you know, what the answer is. And we'll go through the answer at the end. I think we may have had one participant that discovered the answer there from what I could tell. That's fine. Uh, we'll go through the answer at the end. So here we have a probe for this particular lesson. Uh, animal eyes. Two friends were talking about animal eyes. They noticed that animals that are active at night have very large eyes. And this is what they said. Animals like owls have, Sarah, or Laura said, animals like owls, owls have large eyes to help them see in the dark. They do not need light to see. Jaden said animals like owls have large eyes to help them see in the dark. They still need some light to see. Who do you agree with most and why? Okay. Now the answers are going to be all over the place in our classrooms, middle school, high school. They're going to be all over the place. The answer is, this is not an assessment tool. It is a formative assessment tool. It is, but it's not like an assessment tool that you want to take for a grade. This is where you just want students to share their ideas in a very non-threatening way. Be free. It's just share what you think and why, okay? We're not gonna take a grade here. And so what's important with probes is a lot of times to share anonymously. We'll talk about that here in just a second. So students are gonna have different ideas on this. Charles might think, you know, I agree with Jaden because I think the owls are like people. They still need light to see. I think their big eyes help them see more light, okay? Uh, Maya thinks Laura must be right because bats and other animals use sound waves to navigate. So light is not necessary. I can see that. We, you know, students are hearing uh, uh, about science at home, on TV, on the internet, and they, have, they come into our classroom with these preconceptions. Uh, Carson says neither of them are right. right. Owls have special eyes. They make their own light. So we, who knows what our students are thinking coming into the classroom based on their life experiences? To help you with this, with the, with the probe experience, there are videos found online. Okay? So uh, let's, let's take a look at this one for this particular lesson. Now, not every lesson has one of these, but, uh, but, but, but they, they, they are scattered throughout the program. Let's just take a snippet of this one. We're gonna talk about seeing things and how students see things, but I'm gonna give you a warning right now. It's gonna get dark, because I'm gonna turn off the lights. So what do students think about how you see things. Let's take a look. I think your eyes see things because of parts in your body that help your eyes see things. Mm. If your eye sockets are good, then you can see them and you can actually, your eyes can actually tell your brain what color it is. Your eyes are like a mirror. Like, sometimes I do this to my sister, like I'll look in her eyes to see something. And it like, it's so I can see in her eyes, but it's not like on the white part of your eyes. It's not on your, the, it's like somewhere on the brown part and sometimes on your, um, your black thing. I know what that's called, but it just won't come to my mind, but it, it's, it's, you can see through that too. One time I watched a video about eyes and in the back of it, there's like this little flashlight that lets you see everything. And I think that that's the little white thing that's in your eye that lets you see everything. You can see in the video that students have different ideas about how they see things. A common idea is this idea of vision where the eyes actually send stuff out to grab something and bring it back in some way. But the idea that is about the eyes and really it's about the light. So let me show you this diagram. So having the support is, uh, can be important uh, for students, right? And uh, you have to facilitate that discussion. 
you know, ask questions. You don't want to give them the answer. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about that? So when students are sharing their thinking about what they think the answer is, I'm curious, where, where have you seen that before? Have you seen that before? Give them to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, where did that idea come from? Let me see if I'm hearing you correctly. Are you saying this? Refrain yourself from correcting the students. The Paige Keeley Probe experience is not about the correct answer. It's not about sharing the correct answer. It's not about students getting the correct answer. It's about the process. Now in the teacher's edition, um, there's teacher support for it. And one of the strategies that uh, might, you might use with the probe is called the sticky note strategy. Have students put the, what they think the best answer is on a sticky note and post it. Now here in this one, the class is pretty evenly divided. About half the class thinks Jaden is correct and about half the class thinks Laura is correct. Okay, they're posting on sticky note. Another strategy in the Page Keeley Probe arsenal of strategies, and by the way, these are all videos to support these. I'll show those in just a second. I often like to use in trainings is the fingers underneath the chin strategy. If I was with you today, physically in the same room, I might've said, hey, for that uh, chicken and the egg probe, uh, I might've said, uh, let me go back there. I might've said, hey, uh, if you think Sarah has the best answer, I want you all to put one finger underneath your chin. So you can't see me, but I have like a finger like I'm pointing. If you think the best answer is Rodney, I want you to put two fingers underneath your chin. And if you think the best answer is Hakeem, I want you to put three fingers underneath your chin. I want you to look at me the whole time. That's what makes it anonymous, right? I don't want you to sneak a peek at your classmates. Look at me. I don't want to see a fist or, you know, a wavy set of hands and fingers. Give me a definitive one, two, or three. And, and now that's a way for them to anonymously, anonymously share their thinking. And so what Paige Keeley does is shares with you some strategies on how for students to anonymously share their thinking. Now, where are those strategies? Where do those exist? Okay. Where do those strategies exist? Well, let's go online and find those because I find that they're underutilized when uh, teachers are delivering Inspire Science. And I would, I would look at all of these if I were you because I think you'll find use for these, not just in the probes, but anytime you want to have a discussion in your class. I'm going to go to course. This is the digital filing cabinet. And I'm going to go to program resources here. Click on program resources. And then when I scroll down and go to the file folder called professional learning resources, I have library videos here. These are basic implementation videos. But if I scroll down here, there are two sets of video tiles here that say formative assessment science probes. And this one here is strategies for formative assessment science probes. So this video library here, probe basics, goes over just the basics of the probe. Why we do probes, why, the, why formative assessment is important, getting started with probes, um, you know, what's, what probes are all about, just to give you an idea of what probes are all about. The strategies is the one I think you should use the most. Pair every probe that you use with a strategy for maximum success. So if I open up this library, uh, I have videos here that uh, talk about strategies for implementation with the probe, okay? Here they are, two or three before me, four corner strategy. Um, if I scroll down here, fingers underneath the chin strategy. That's the one I just talked about, where you put one, two, or three fingers off your chin. So all of these are strategies that, that we'll use for the probe. Now you might think, well, I don't wanna go there. Show me, the, show me the, the probe strategy that's best for the probe that I'm doing today. Well, Inspire Science has done that as well. So if I go to this particular lesson that we happen to be in, and I scroll down to the lesson level, the role of Animal Eyes, here in my planning folders for the probe, in my, or my planning resources rather, lesson planning, underneath the lesson at a glance, here's that preconception video. There's three different ones here. This is the one we took a peek at where those three girls were sharing their ideas. And here are two probe strategies we think uh, you might use with this probe. Argumentation lines and two or three before me. So that video that might be, uh, that shows the best practice for this particular probe 
is right here in your lesson planning folder. And always pair a probe with a strategy. Here's another strategy. It's a sticky note strategy. We, I, I talked about that just a little bit ago. Here's a big one, because we're going to revisit that our thinking over the course of the lesson. In this particular probe, which is a different probe, this is, a, again, from another classroom I took a picture of. Uh, at the beginning of the lesson, students thought A was the best answer. You may not see this blue sticky note. It says April 15th. That marks the beginning of the lesson. And a lot of students thought A was the best answer. Sure, certainly not all of them, because I see blue in every single answer choice, but most of them thought A. A week later, they've had a few experiences now, haven't they? They've probably done an inquiry activity, a lab. They've done some research. Now a week into the lesson in purple, this says April 22nd in purple, now they've come off of A quite a bit. Okay, now their answers are pretty more evenly distributed. In fact, I think B and D have the best, most answer choices. Uh, and then two weeks into the lesson in yellow, now they're starting to think D is the best possible answer. And in Inspire Science, you're constantly having students revisit their thinking. And the sticky note strategy is just one way to do that. And this mirrors the way scientists approach uh, science. Even scientists change their thinking as they get additional evidence. So uh, I have a video here. So there's a temptation to give students the best answer. Okay, like I could have given you the best answer for that egg probe that we did, or any probe, you know, and they're going to want to know the best answer. But why don't we give them the best answer? Let's have Paige share with you why. After students have responded to a probe, what do you do when students ask you, what's the right answer? Now, of course, all the students want to know what the right answer is because the probes are engaging and intrinsically interesting to them. But I think the important thing to take away is that you don't want to give them the answer right away. You want students to what I call hang out in uncertainty for a while and keep thinking about it. Because once you give them the answer, the thinking stops and you want students to keep thinking. Sometimes it takes several lessons or several days before students have all the conceptual pieces to put together to understand what the best answer is. Now, notice the language that I just used. I didn't say the right answer, I said the best answer. And I think it's really important for you to change your language. Instead of referring to right or wrong answers, we should always be thinking about, here's our best thinking so far. Here's the best answer I have at this point. It also mirrors the nature of science because even scientists change their thinking as they get more information. So we always want to use the terminology of the best answer, not what the right answer is, but what's the best answer that explains our thinking. And to hold off on giving students the, the answer right away, um, let them grapple with it. Let them work on it, let them struggle with it. And it creates that desire to know. And that's what we want to have happen in our classroom. Students who are really interested in finding out the answers. And so every lesson will begin with a probe experience. Now I'm spending a, a little bit, uh, an inordinate amount of time on this probe because it's such, it's such a foundational piece in the lesson. Every lesson begins this way. Um, and I just want to share another thought with this Mitten Probe and best practice. Now, many of you have probably seen me use the Mitten Probe before. And here's the scenario. Science, science, Sarah Science class is investigating heat energy. They wonder what would happen to the temperature in a thermometer if they put the thermometer inside of a mitten. Sarah's group obtained two thermometers and a mitten. They put one thermometer inside the mitten and the other thermometer on the table next to the mitten. An hour later, they compared the readings on the two thermometers. The temperature in the room remained the same throughout the experiment. What do you think Sarah's group will discover from their investigation? Circle the response that best matches your thinking. Do you think that A, the thermometer inside a mitten, will have a lower temperature reading than the thermometer on the table? Do you think that B, the thermometer inside a mitten, will have a higher temperature reading than the thermometer on the table? Or do you think that C, both thermometers, will have the same temperature reading? Real fast, let me have you respond to this probe. Go ahead and put it in the chat. Who do you think the best answer is 
and why? Do you think the best answer is A? Do you think the best answer is B? Or do you think the best answer is C? I'm going to I'm going to take this a different direction after I get some some best answer choices from you all. What do you think the best answer is for this poll? Okay, let me go into the chat here. I've got a B. Miriam thinks B. Sanja thinks C. Okay, very good. Very good. Okay, let, who else do we have here? Let me close it out. Okay, very good. I've got a C. Diana thinks D. Mira thinks C. Very good. I've got C's and B's so far. Uh, Nerman thinks B. Amal thinks C. Sally C. Okay, very good. They're coming fast and furious. Uh, same temperature. It's an open system. Okay, got an explanation there. Remember, uh, answer and explanation is what we want to do, but I just ask for the answer. So if you just put the answer, that's fine also. Hala puts B. Sharina puts C. Very good. So one thing, thing the, the point I want to make for this particular probe, uh, when you're doing probes, is notice Paige Cayley says, what's the best answer, okay? So uh, that's, that's real important. There may not be a perfect answer with some of these probes, but you want to choose the best possible answer. And in this particular scenario, thank you all, by the way, thank you for sharing. In this particular probe, when I use it, I often get teachers that ask, you know, I, there's information that I need to know. I'm, I'm so I'm curious about this. I, you know, I, I ask, okay, what's that information? What do you want to know about this probe? Okay, let me go back. What's not provided that you're curious about? Well, wh where, where, where was the mitten stored prior to this taking place? What's the temperature of the room? That's, you know, and that, that might make a difference, right? Uh, so is this, are we talking about a room that's freezing? Is, there, is the room 80 degrees? Is this inside? Is this taking place outside? Where is where within the room is this taking place? Is it underneath an air conditioning duct? Um, what kind of mitten is it? Is it one a really thin mitten, or are we talking about a real thick insulated mitten? You know, really like an oven mitt or even a welder's mitt or something. What are we talking about? Some teachers might say, "What's a table made out of? Is it a wooden table? Is it a stainless steel table?" These are all wonderful questions, and these mirror how what students are going to think with your probes. They're going to have questions too. They're going to say, it doesn't give me enough information. I need to know more. I need to know more. I need to know more. And that is great opportunities for you because you can have them investigate this. What you'll find is that many of the probes lend themselves, not all of them, but many of them will lend themselves to a, 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 an investigation. So if you want students to test it, you know, uh, give them that task. Say, hey, I want you to test this and come back and report. Uh, if the table made a difference in this particular probe. Okay, so think of the probes as uncovering misconceptions, getting students talking and sharing their ideas, and then uh, uh, possibly an investigation to, um, to extend it. So things to consider with probes. We spend quite a bit of time on it because they're so important. Have students respond to the probe anonymously first. That's really important, okay? Uh, and there's, there's all sorts of strategies to have them do that. Another one, I won't play the video, I could, but I, another one is called the paper toss strategy. I kind of like this one as well. Have students write their answer on a sheet of paper or on the probe, because they're in the book and they're printable. So you're gonna have this probe in front of them. They write their answer and what they think the thinking is on the paper. So imagine this, students writing their own answer and their thinking. Now they take that paper, the probe, and they crumple it up. Now they toss it around the room, okay? Get enough tossing going around. Now they pick up somebody else's paper. And from that point on, they're only sharing the answer and the thinking of somebody else in the classroom, okay? So it takes the edge off of them um, sharing their own answer. If you think uh, paper tossing around the room is a little too chaotic, uh, there's a fold and pass strategy. So instead of crumbling up and throwing it around, you fold the paper and then you just kind of pass it around the room till I say stop. And you pass, 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 pass. Then I say stop. Okay, now unfold that paper. Now I want you to share the thinking and the answer from that person. That's an anonymous response technique. Do it anonymously first, okay? 
always pair the probe with a strategy. And as I shared before, our lessons are set up with that strategy right here in lesson planning. Don't wing it. Don't go on your own uh, with this. Pair it with a strategy. They're found in lesson planning right here. And the ones we think you might want to use are here. There are others that could be used here. So don't keep your mind open to another strategy found in the program resources. But these are two that, that you want to start with. Okay. So have them respond anonymously. Always pair a probe with a strategy. Remember not to give the answer. We heard Paige talk about it. And make sure stone, as students know that you won't. And, and you may think, well, what do you mean by that? I had a teacher just this last week that said, you know what? I, I like the fact that you're not giving them the answer because if I'm a student and I'm a little hesitant and a little insecure, and I and I'm gonna uh, and I know that you're gonna give the answer, I don't want to be wrong, right? I don't want to be wrong. So why would I share my answer if you're gonna tell the, the correct answer? And I might be wrong. And now I feel you know kind of silly for having shared the answer. So let your students know ahead of time hey, we're not going to share the answer here. Let them know that. That's important for the success. You're not, this isn't about sharing the answer. You're free to share your thinking going into the lesson. Very important. It's the best practice. If the probe is suited for it, consider students test for the correct answer. And I would do that at the end of the lesson. Okay, so like the mitten probe that I just shared, if a student is very curious if the table uh, material would make a difference, have them test that at the end. So I've got a question for you. How have you used in your probes in your classroom successfully? Uh, share a tip or best practice. Anything, now I've shared quite a bit here, so I may have exhausted everything that you've used. Uh, but if you've, if you've done something a little bit differently or maybe shared them on a different platform or something, go ahead and share that in chat. How have you used probes in your classrooms? Uh, Nola says we can vote for the answers. I like that. You could do a little vote for the answers. That's, that's not a bad idea. Um, how else might you use probes? Uh, it's about making students think about question and investigations. I like that thing. Think about the variable that we're measuring. How else might you consider yourself using probes? And if you haven't used probes yet, Go ahead and share how you might consider using probes, things, how you can see yourself using it in your classroom for your lessons. Go ahead and put that in the chat. Got some thinking going on here. Answers are being formulating. I can formulate it, I can tell. Any thinking on probes? Give students a brainstorming background first, then leave the space for them to think. Thank you. Thank you, Al Shaman. Very, thank you for sh uh, sharing that. Giving students a brainstorming background first and leaving the space for them to think. It's so important that they have the opportunity. Finger signals, then a buzzing strategy. Do you agree or not agree? I like the buzz strategy. Uh, and finger signals. That's perfect, Fatima. Thank you very much. One way to teach get head students hesitant. Let me go ahead and enlarge this again. Uh, fingers uh, hesitant. If not, what do they believe? Excellent open end questions for the Nearpod ad, app or poll. So yes, yeah, Sanja, these make great tools for Nearpod or really any polling tool that you use. Answer in written and ask for them to revisit over time and self-assess if they change your mind. Excellent, thank you, Yasmin. Um, we first try to solve it and then watch a video about the related subject that we try to see which student is closest to the answer, try to explain why. Thank you, Diana, for sharing that. Excellent ideas and best practices for this probe experience. Probes are really useful. It makes kids ready for the class by starting to think, get their attention uh, to the class. Excellent. Thank you, Sharina. Igniting the student's curiosity by asking for an individual uh, feedback. Thank you, Nadera. And it gets students talking. Right. If it's if it if you create a non-threatening environment for them to share their thinking, you'd be surprised how much talking they will do. Okay. They know that you're not going to give them the rest best answer right in the front end. They are free to share their thinking and their ideas, and that's what you want to have happen. Students sharing their thinking, sharing their ideas in uh, the probe at the beginning of the lesson. 
Thank you all, keep, keep them coming. But uh, let's continue throughout this lesson. The probes are integral, that's why we spent so much time on them and they, they can serve so many purposes in the science classroom. And by the way, just like any other resource, some teachers say, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna assign these remotely or I'm gonna print these out. And as you know, in the lesson planning folders, I could print this out. There's a PDF version of this, okay? which would lend itself to the paper toss or the fold and pass around strategy. Or I can assign this remotely, have students do it outside of class, consider it, think about it. And then that frees up class time to talk about it. Okay, so think about assigning this remotely as well. Okay, really nice tool. Anything in Inspire Science can be assigned remotely. When we get to the lesson level engage, let's continue to walk through this model lesson. Um, I have a phenomenon here as well. How do eyes help animals see? In this particular phenomenon, this is lesson two on this module, the role of animal eyes. I've got a phenomenon. It says go online to see this phenomenon in action. Okay, so this phenomenon is cat eyes. What's this cat looking at? Why are his eyes changing shape? Is something getting closer to the cat or farther away? Is more or less light coming into the room? Is it possible the cat's communicating to another cat using its eyes? What's going on there? Now to present this lesson phenomenon, just for those of you that may be somewhat new to Inspire Science or haven't used this tool, how could I project this to my students? How could I use this or plan to use this? I could go to engage and here's that encounter the phenomenon. Exactly where it is in the book is where I'm gonna find it in my file folders. I could uh, open it up, open it up in another window, because I always do that, you may not, but I, I do that. And now I have it in its own window and I'm ready for class. And now it mirrors the presentation uh, of the book. And so I could go from uh, page one to page two here, page one, Here's that role of animal eyes. It looks just like the book. And I can go to page two and here's that video. It's ready for me to watch right here. And then on page three up here, I've got some questions here, just like the book. So it mirrors the book. This presentation, these tools are a cover to cover presentation of the book. So I could go straight here to this resource or I could go to this presentation tool. And again, this is an underutilized tool for planning and lesson delivery. The benefit of doing this here, as opposed to uh, engage, is if I use this, it's going to begin and end with this engage activity. And that might be fine for you. But if you want to organize the entire lesson presentation, you could do so here. So if I go to edit, I have, if I scroll through here, I have that probe. Here it is, first part of the lesson. And I have the engage right here. So I've got uh, the entire lesson illuminated. And what's not illuminated are things we, you could add to this lesson if you so choose. So these are, these are optional things. So maybe, um, let me hide this Zoom tool right here. Maybe you want to show the entire class this argumentation line strategy. So instead of you just showing it to them, you, let, you, uh, you illuminate it so we could all watch it together. And maybe you want them to see, oh, oh, let me see here. How about this vocabulary activity? Let me illuminate it, add this to the presentation. And then I could bring this to the forefront. So instead of saying that video at the, uh, in that one resource tool, I could make it as part of a larger presentation, okay? And maybe I wanna bring it to the front, this phenomenon video on the cat. So now I can organize my lesson presentation in the way that I think I want to present it, have the tools that I want to be a part of it. And now when I go to my launch presentation here, I have a presentation. This is not PowerPoint, but it is a presentation tool that's organized the way I want to look, use it. So now I have that phenomenon video here, just like I, 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 we saw before. But instead of starting and ending here, I could go to next resource. That's the benefit of putting it in a larger presentation. Now I can go to the next resource here. And here's that vocabulary resource that I activated. It wasn't activated before, but it's activated because I, I, I illuminated it. And underneath here, there are teacher tools that I could activate, okay? So in case I need just to remember how I might integrate this, 
I've got my teacher planning tools, okay? The same with that previous one. If I go to encounter the phenomena, every now and then I might go, well, how, how was I supposed to integrate this? What should I do? Go to my little teacher note here, okay? It'll tell me the lesson objective. Here's my teacher toolbox. Okay, I'm ready to present this now. So let me go back to the presentation. And I can go from resource to resource by clicking on this next resource tool here. This lesson presentation tool is very helpful, especially when you want to um, show phenomena. Here's that argumentation lines video. Here's that strategy. So um, we won't watch it, but maybe you want to assign it to students say, hey, this is the activity we're gonna do tomorrow with the probe. Just to kind of give you an idea of what we're gonna do, take a look at this video uh, before we come to class tomorrow. And I can go from resource to resource this way. Here's that probe, Animalize, presented digitally. Okay, that's the benefit of using the launch presentation. Instead of going to a single activity, a single resource, I could align all of the resource in the sequence that I want and activate some activities that I choose. Maybe, you know what? I might activate a level reader so I could do anything I want in this lesson presentation. Okay. Uh, in the teacher's edition, just like before, there are talk about it. the idea and the things to consider here. The idea, just like the module phenomena, is to generate questions and curiosity. Consider assigning the lesson phenomena online. So remember, we saw that um, those remote instruction uh, suggestions right here, planning for remote instruction. And if you take a good look at it, one of the suggestions it says is assigning the phenomena remotely. So you could do that very quickly and easily, right? So instead of uh, let's all watch it together, maybe if you're in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, this is just a suggestion. Maybe you assign this digitally. Have students watch this outside of class so that when we watch it coming into class, and maybe you watch it again in class, but now they've seen it before and you've tasked them with, hey, I want you to come in with questions that you have about this. We'll watch it together at the beginning of class but I want you to come in with three questions that you have about this phenomenon. And so instead of students right at the beginning of the class having to think of questions, uh, you know, just quickly and fastly, and, and you may not get a good discussion that way. If you task them outside of class, now that discussion will happen. So I'm gonna tell students watch, come into class with three questions you have about this cat and the eyes. Okay. Be ready to share at the beginning of class. Okay. So now when they come into class, that discussion is ready, it's primed, it's ready to go. You might even say to have them printed out and have them ready, have them written down or have them written down so they don't forget them. Uh, and bring those into class. And I can assign that phenomena video. Now it's been sent to my students, okay? Just, just suggestions here. And that's what we're going through with this model lessons. Suggestions on how you might uh, implement. So I'm gonna skip past this just for the sake of time. Lesson phenomena, because we kind of talked about this in the module phenomena. Lesson idea is designed to spark curiosity. So how do you think about how you're gonna get your students to share your ideas? We've shared quite a few best practices already. So we're gonna explore now the second E in the 5E lesson model. Uh, we call them inquiry activities in K through five. We call them labs in middle school. Uh, and the which E you're in will always show up at the bottom of the page if you hadn't seen that. So we're gonna explore. Always means a hands-on lab or activity. They're always gonna be yellow, outlined yellow. Now. One of the things that uh, to consider here, consult the teacher's edition first when doing a lab, then the inquiry preview video, okay? So teacher's edition first. I have that teacher's edition up and running in a preview. So where would I consult? Well, if I'm planning for this lesson, the first thing I might wanna consult is that inquiry planning tool. So I have an inquiry planner. So this shares with me, this, is, uh, this isn't from this lesson. Let's go to the one for this lesson here. Let me scroll down. Information processing and transfer. 
And here's my inquiry planner for this. So first I wanna get an idea of about how long this lab is gonna take, right? Uh, how I might implement it, consumable and non-consumable resources. Because you might say right off the bat, I don't have this. I, I don't have these resources. I, I can't do this, or I've got to go find these resources. So let's give you a big picture of the lab experience, right? But it's not detailed enough. So this is in the teacher's edition. It's called the inquiry teacher plan. Not detailed enough. So the second thing that I, I would look at would be uh, the inquiry teacher preview video. Now this is gonna be more detailed and this is underutilized, I feel as well. So if I go into, uh, let's go back into my course view here. I go into my lesson planning. I have an inquiry teacher preview video here. Now this is inquiry teacher preview is designed for you, the teacher. How do you set up a lab? How, uh, how to, uh, you know, science, content background going into the lab. Uh, what the outcomes are gonna be, what student questions are likely to. I'll play a few minutes of this and then we'll uh, fast forward. This inquiry preview will help you prepare the light travels activity. This hands-on activity requires 15 minutes of prep time, takes about 30 minutes to complete, and works best when students are placed in small groups. You may adjust the group size as resources allow. It is also possible for this investigation to work as a whole class activity. The purpose of this activity is to investigate how light travels and what types of objects reflect light. Animals have a variety of different... So I'm just gonna fast forward this just a little strikes bit. Strikes the surface. Science we'll background coding. information. Compass how the reflection of paper it will tell you how before to set class starts. It will tell you how First, to set up the gather lab. the materials. For each student group, you will need a mirror, white paper, flashlight, protractor, cup of sand, clear cup of water, index card, and a hand lamp. This activity's detractors activity as a so set their everything explain you need to be successful. Let's follow lab. the procedure for this activity. As students move through the steps, it should be lit paper. Have a partner face the mirror and shine the flashlight directly into the mirror. Using a pencil, have students trace the ray of light. Be sure to draw the arrows to show how the light moves to and from the mirror. So it goes through the lab step by step. Now, when I was teaching uh, science, I had to consult the teacher's edition. And the teacher's edition is great, uh, it has support there. So if I go into the role of Animalize and I go into uh, my inquiry activity, I have support in the teacher's edition. Uh, I, I have the support over here, but a lot of times just reading it, for me anyway, you know, I, I, I can't visualize it. Uh, how is it supposed to look? And you're looking at the teacher's edition and asking yourself, I can't visualize how is this gonna look on my table? And then you can start getting intimidated by it and thinking well, and looking for ways not to use this lab, right? Because you don't think you could set it up perfectly the way the teacher's edition says you'd set it up. Well, that was the, that, that was the past. Now you have this inquiry teacher preview video that will show you how to set it up and how it will look from step to step, every single step along the way. And there's a lab video for middle school teachers well, as well. So after you've watched all of this, then you can properly decide, is this lab doable? Yeah, I feel confident going into this. I have all of the resources. I can see how it's set up. And I think this meets the lesson objectives. And then you can decide what to do. Modify the activity to meet your needs. Every single activity, and I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again, uh, you know, uh, make it perfect for you. So if you need to, as, as a, every a good teacher does, and you guys do this already, uh, you modify the activity to meet your needs. So a best practice uh, I'd like for you to share out here in the chat. What modifications are best practice to use when you implement a lab or hands-on activity? What's, uh, how do you make lab days successful in your classroom? Go ahead and put that in chat if you don't mind. Are there any way to do all the inquiry activities during remote learning? Great question. Uh, Probably not all of them, Saba. That's, can we do them all remotely? Um, 
probably not all of them because some of them, you know, they're gonna have materials that students just aren't gonna have at home. An alternative might be a virtual simulation or investigation. Now, there aren't as many virtual simulations as there are traditional investigations, so just keep that in mind. But yeah, some of those resources students are gonna to need to have at home. Some they may be able to do at home, but not all of them. Um, due to COVID restrictions, let me see if I open this up here so I can see the questions. Uh, Tabasam, the webinar, I'm gonna wrap it up here pretty quickly. We're, it's taking a little bit more time than I thought. We use Inquiry Rewind because we can't use a school lab. Okay, we, Lauren uses Inquiry Rewind. Very good, I'm gonna talk about Inquiry Rewind just in a little bit. So let me move swiftly here. Um, so the design for you, the teacher, it has a companion called the Inquiry Rewind. So to the question, can we do every lab uh, remotely? You can do the lab themselves, but maybe the next best thing is for students to watch the lab remotely. So if you're in a remote environment right now, you have a video as well. It's called the Inquiry Rewind. The Inquiry Teacher Preview is designed for you to feel confident. The Inquiry Rewind video is for students to see every single lab experience. Where is that found? Let's take a look at it really fast in case you don't know. If I go into uh, Explore and Explain, right underneath the lab is the Inquiry Rewind video. And I could assign it just like I can any other lab. So my students may not be able to do this at home. Assigning this might be seldom because most students won't gonna aren't gonna have sand and, and maybe water and a flashlight. They're just not gonna have all of these resources. But you could assign the video version of it to your students. So just keep that in mind. For those labs that are too dangerous, too time consuming, too expensive in class, there are virtual investigations. Middle school, you have virtual labs. Elementary, they are all simulations. Just keep that in mind. Uh, middle school, you have both virtual labs and simulations. When we get to explain, uh, those reference, those simulations and investigations are referenced within the student edition narrative, just letting you know that they're there and available to you. When we get to elaborate, don't forget, uh, and it's elaborate, it's a STEM career connection. Don't forget these, uh, these um, avatars, we call them STEM career kids. They're available to you online. Three, three things to consider when doing just the bulk of the lesson narrative. Remember the language building activities. Digital resources can be assigned for exploration. We took it, we've talked about that quite a bit. And the use of the EL and differentiating tips. I talked about that, the EL boxes in the teacher's edition at the beginning of the module and within the, individual, uh, within the lesson. So where's this language building activities? I think it's uh, a little bit underutilized as well. I go into, um, uh, let's go into module planning here. Let me go into module resources and scroll down. I have this resource called language building activities. And uh, there's some nice little games here as well. So these are vocabulary tools, this is a word, word ladder. These are different little vocabulary games that you can integrate into your instruction. So just think about the, this vocabulary game tool. Let's take a look at this last one here. Vocabulary game, what's in my head? So uh, a lot of times it gets overlooked. Every module has it. Uh, and so consider that as part of something you use in the lesson narrative as well. Uh, just for time sake, I'm going to skip over this one, but let's just read it. When you want a video or activity or additional narrative, where do you go? So I'm sure you have sources on YouTube and other places that you go to get additional supplemental support for the lesson narrative. I'm going to share some via links here in just a little bit. Um, but if you have time, if you're still with us, go ahead and share in the chat what you use to get an additional video and activity. A place that you, you go. Do you know what this supplement your lessons? Here are those STEM. Do you know what this is? Yes, it's an X ray. In fact, it's an X ray of an iguana. They're cute as can be. They, uh, students of different genders, different uh, nationalities, but they have one thing in common they love science. The primary kids, uh, they, they really love these and they're integrated within those lessons to get students thinking about uh, STEM careers at a much earlier age. So if you're not using the videos, go ahead and pull those out and see how your students respond to those. When we get to the end of the lesson, time to revisit that probe. 
And we saw that sticky note strategy here at the beginning. Now students thinking have changed quite a bit. Now they're thinking Jaden has the best answer for this animalized probe. So just one way to use a probe is the sticky notes. There are many others. Uh, I used to think, but now I know. Here is just a real short video uh, about Paige talking about um, student thinking and changing over time. I'm just gonna play a minute or two of it. There's a tendency to use the formative assessment probes at the beginning to elicit students' initial ideas, but the probes can actually be used throughout a sequence of instruction at the beginning, throughout the learning process, and even at the end for reflection. A strategy that you can use to get students to reflect back on how their ideas have changed is called, I used to think, but now I know. And students fill in the blanks with what they used to think when they first responded to the probe and what they now know, which are their new ideas, how they've e either changed or been solidified as they went through the learning. I'll let you listen to the rest of that um, in the Page Clearly Probe Library, but that's just one strategy. At the end of the lesson, things to consider, revisit the probe, talk about it. I used to think, I, but now I know is one vehicle for you to do that. Summative assessment, there's a pre-made quiz ready for you. Where is that located? Well, in that lesson, role of animal eyes, in that file folder titled assessment, I or evaluate, I scroll down here, I have a lesson quiz waiting for me. I could print it out, and make copies. There's a PDF version here. So I could print it out and make copies, or I could assign that same, uh, or that, uh, or, or a lesson quiz digitally as well. So consider uh, a pre-made quiz that's ready for you. Performance task, it's time to contribute to the STEM module project. And in grade six through eight, there's a Learn Smart tool available to you as well. So um, the STEM project, at the end of every lesson, it's asking students to contribute to it. Um, and Learn Smart, we'll talk about here in just a moment. Integrate foldables. Foldables are three-dimensional graphic organizers. So anywhere in the lesson, beginning, middle, or end, students can uh, organize their information on these kinesthetic activities. Okay, so cons consider that as a tool in Inspire Science. Um, as part of your packet, I'm going to leave with you afterwards. I'm going to, I have a document that shares with you strategies for using foldables and what foldables might be used for different content areas. And you can make these nice little notebooks with foldables or mini science projects with foldables. So consider that as part of the narrative. We took a look at differentiation earlier. I'm going through these slides just a little bit. We know uh, quickly now, we know that elementary, you can augment your lessons with level readers, science investigator articles, uh, paired read opportunities in K1 and 2. These paired read opportunities can be projected. Let's all read together, as opposed to using a big book and have students gathered around. They come in level for students approaching level. Blue is on level, green is beyond level, and purple is ELL. So these are all ways to augment and to introduce literacy into your lesson. What's nice about these level readers is that each one comes with an activity at the end. So if you're still teaching remotely, students are at home, these activities at the end of the level readers, these they can do. Most of them they can do. So unlike the labs that might require materials that students don't have, think of assigning this activity at the end of the level reader. They'll probably have this at home. It might require internet or something readily available at home. K-5 teachers, you have investigator articles as well that go through engineering breakthroughs. Each one of these, engine, uh, these uh, investigator articles has a task at the end as well, a mini assessment. Now, all along the way, students are getting a little bit of the information to be able to answer that question, to answer that phenomena that we saw at the beginning. So, Things to consider for differentiation, check the TE for strategies, really maximize all the tools found in the margins. Use the level readers or other ancillary support. And in grades six through eight, consider Learn Smart and SmartBook. Learn Smart and SmartBook is an adaptive, personalized learning tool. Now, uh, where students are reading and they're being assessed continuously. Middle school teachers, you may not have used this very often. Uh, and I'm gonna share with you what it looks like on my, comp my, um, my phone really fast. Let's make sure this works here. 
Let me go ahead and share this. Give me just a second here. And uh, I'm not seeing my phone available. So we'll, we'll have to do that in another session. I have it, I have it recorded as well. So I could send you a recording. But students have their book on video or uh, on this uh, Learn Smart, and then they're being asked questions along the way. Uh, it's rating, they're rating their confidence. And now they can have uh, um, an experience that's collecting data about what they know and what they don't know. So uh, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna kind of go over this really fast. We're not gonna share out, but what, think about a success, simple best practice that you use while integrating instruction. And go ahead and put it in the, the share tool. Uh, I'm gonna take a look at it after this Zoom, but go ahead and share things that you use to differentiate instruction. At the end of all modules, there's that STEM module project that awaits students. It's a performance task. Uh, and students, if in this one, are gonna use the engineering design loop to come up with a creative solution to this problem. Now, remember I said, uh, if, if you have a STEM project that you think works better for your students, feel free to use this, but know that the STEM project is integrated within the experience. And how is 6.8 a little bit different? Let's transition into 6.8 just a little bit. 6.8 has claim evidence and reasoning in each and every lesson. There's a two-page spread found right after the lesson phenomena. Hint, hint, wink, wink. That's about to be in the Kahoot that we're about to start. After every lesson phenomena in Engage, there is a two-page spread. Elementary teachers, you have a one-page claim evidence and reasoning for them. This is just a research-based approach for students to document evidence and connect a claim with evidence in order to make a reasoning statement at the end. Um, it's, uh, there's lots of support with claim evidence and reasoning uh, online, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it today, but know, you need to know how it's integrated into the Inspire Science classroom. And that is wherever you see these blue boxes. So students see this blue box, that's their clue. You'll see these, and usually in the, in the inquiry activities in grades K-5, but in grades six, eight, they might appear right within the lesson narrative. And that is their clue, and it'll tell them exactly what to do. It says, hey, go back to that two-page spread, and it's time to collect evidence. Okay, it's time to collect evidence. So it'll tell them exactly where to put that evidence. So that blue box is the key to claim evidence and reasoning inspire science. Wherever you see that, it's time to revisit our thinking. And notice that revised claim. Just like we're revisiting our thinking with the probes, we're revisiting our thinking with claim evidence and reasoning. Because that initial claim, just like the probe's initial claim, it may be wrong. In fact, most likely it'll probably be a little inaccurate. Uh, let's revise it over time and revisit our thinking. Elementary teachers, there are sentence starters. You have claims that, uh, that are, uh, students can choose from. Instead of writing down a claim, they, they get to circle their claim as to what they think the best answer is in grade one. So even you have claim evidence reasoning, but your support uh, that's developmentally appropriate for your students. A one-page spread in elementary, a two-page spread when you get to middle school. So when can claim evidence or reasoning be used? Use it to engage with phenomena and revisit in order to explain or refute the phenomena. That's one suggestion. You don't have to use it that way, but that's one. Use it after an experiment to explain why a hypothesis was proven correct or not. Use it to, and I like this last one, because this may be a little bit more relevant to your students. Use it to discuss claims in videos or commercials. Students watch commercials, bring in a commercial to your class and have them uh, make a claim about that. See if it can be supported with evidence. That's a great way to use claim evidence and reasoning, especially if you wanna introduce it to your classroom. Think of using it with commercials. Um, and these are some sentence starters. There are many that you can use to get that discussion going. Middle school, you have a reading essentials tool as well. It's a lower level read of your textbook. Where do I find it? Well, when I go to, um, when I go to uh, my lesson, I gotta get out of fourth grade and go to middle school. I get from my program resources and go into middle school here. Uh, I'm gonna see the reading essentials uh, right here in my dashboard. I'll also see it in my course view. 
at the module level and lesson level. So I could go right here into module uh, planning resources. Let's go into uh, my module opener. Does it exist there? No, I don't see it there. Let me go into a lesson here, benefits of biodiversity. And if I go to my lesson library, let's see if it's here. Here, I've lost track of where that reading essentials is here. Let's go to lesson planning. Pardon me, I've, I've done a quite a few, oh, it's explore and explain, I bet. I've done quite a few trainings here. I'm a little bit off on this reading essentials here. Let's scroll down here. There it is, explore and explain. Here's that reading essentials, and it'll be a lower level read of the textbook, okay? It's an alternative narrative to the student book. In fact, it's additional narrative. Middle school teachers have shared with us, you know what? We love Inspire Science, but there's just not as much narrative as I'm used to. I'm used to more reading and more, more, more uh, just more narrative in general. If you feel that way, because because the, the student edition is packed with experiences, labs, probes, STEM projects, claim evidence and reasoning. And if you want additional narrative, this lesson, this reading essentials is where you want to go. You'll find it in study tools uh, under explore and explain. Okay. So the reading essentials is important to you. And the, don't forget learn smart. And once students are on learn smart, you have the ability to collect data to see how they're performing. Okay. Uh, and finally, assessment. The ability to assess students different ways, including a 3D assessment. So uh, I'm towards the end of my time and I wanna respect, your, uh, respect yours. I know it's been a long day. I had planned, I didn't know how long this session would take. I had planned on going online to show basic navigation and stuff. But I, I think you, uh, you've you navigated the online platform enough, but I wanna share just one thing with you because I think you're gonna need it with this Kahoot tool. Finding resources is, is uh, you have two tools. The course view, which I've already shared, is my digital filing cabinet. I have file folders in that filing cabinet. The resources tool is my filtering tool. I can filter by keyword, location, or even resource type, okay? So the resources tool is a filtering tool. Hint, hint, wink, wink. How would you like to filter to find what you're looking for, okay? So, uh, Hopefully I gave you some suggestions on how to maximize the probe, how you might integrate the phenomena remotely, possibly. I would, if it were me, if I were in the classroom, I would send the phenomena and all videos out remotely and have the students the task. If I want you to come in ready with three questions you have about that video, uh, and then we're gonna watch it together and I want you to share those questions. Uh, labs. If you're doing labs, don't forget all the support available to you, the inquiry teacher preview, inquiry rewind. Uh, elementary, you have all of this literacy support, leveled readers, investigator articles, paired read aloud. And at the end of all lessons, you have that STEM project that awaits. In middle school, you have a very similar set of experiences that help our students become the next generation of innovators. Now I have a Kahoot that's waiting for you. I know this has taken longer than we had planned, I, I, I thank everyone that is still with us. And I have a Kahoot uh, that I want to you to do. And many of you are familiar with Kahoot. If you are not, let me go ahead and hide my Zoom window. Um, Hi, Jason. Sorry for interrupting. Yes. We've got actually two questions of people saying, how can you play Kahoot? And since you're just on the subject, I thought I will just let you know. Oh, thank you. Okay, well, let's take a look here. I'll, I'll share with you how to do it in just a second. This Kahoot is loading. And here's how we're gonna do it. You need to go to kahoot.it. Go to www.kahoot.it. And it's gonna ask you for a pin. It's gonna ask you for a pin. Go ahead and enter that pin. Then it's gonna ask you for your name. Go ahead and put your name in and your name will start showing up on my screen. So if you want to uh, use a phone, use your phone. That's what I would suggest you use, a phone or another device. Go to kahoot.it. Theo is in, Lauren is in, Alara is in. I'm gonna give you plenty of time here. So I know we have some folks that haven't used this before. Mira, Nora is are all in.
Six of you are in. I'll give you time. I'll give you plenty of time to get uh, loaded. Here. Razan is in. Alar is in. Very good. Yasmin, you are in. Now they're starting to come in fast and furious. About 10, Mira. What else do we have here? Maggie. People want to know if there is there a link to join. There's not a link to join. You have to open up a browser window. So go to your phone, your browser on your phone, and go to uh, www.kahoot.it. Thank you, Jason, for repeating those instructions for us. Yeah, and then it's going to ask you for a PIN. It's six numbers. Go ahead and enter that PIN. And then it's going to ask you for your name. And go ahead and put your name. And, and as if you can see my screen, hopefully you're using your phone so you can see my screen. Um, you're going to see, um, and if you're not using your phone, that's fine also. I can tell you who's ahead as we go through this. You're seeing your name populate on my screen. At least I'm seeing it. We're up to 30. I'm going to give you some more time here. So I know we have more than that on the call. Iman, you are in. Hola, you have made it. Serena, you are in. So as people are uh, joining, let me just share with you what Kahoot is in, uh, what is, what it is. I have five questions that I'm going to ask you, and there will be answer choice, like A, B, C, and D. It's like multiple choice questions. And there may be a true or false, and you'll see some colors on there. So the answers will be blue or red or green, and all you have to choose is the best answer. You think A is the best answer, B, C, or D? It's basically just a multiple choice quiz. What do you think the answer, the answer is true or false? And that's really all you have to do. And these will be basic inspire science questions. Now, along the way, I've given you little hints. I might have sent said hint, hint, wink, wink. Remember this, you might want to remember this. I try to give you little clues along the way. Uh, think about, I think I'll just remind you of a couple. Every module and lesson in Inspire Science, what, what starts every module and lesson in Inspire Science? That may be one you want to you want to remember. Another one I think I said is at the end was the resources, the resource search is a filtering tool. That's what I like to call it. I like to call it a filtering tool because you can filter by keyword you could filter down to the location that you want support for, or you could filter by resource type. So the filter tool. Chris, you're in. We we'll give just a moment or two for a few more to join, and then we're going to get started. All right. We're now we're losing a few folks, so let's let's go ahead and get started. Sorry if you didn't have time to join. So let's go ahead and get started. We're back up to fifty. I'm going to click start here. Get ready for the quiz. Inspire Science Quiz in three, two, one. In Inspire Science, every module and lesson begins. Is it phenomena? Do we begin with a story? Do we begin with a vocabulary list? Or do we begin every module and lesson with a lab? What do you think the best answer is? You got 20 seconds. Every lesson begins with a phenomena. Excellent. We had one person that says lab. Now labs come pretty early in the lesson model. They come in and explore, but not at the very beginning. It's a phenomena. So there's I didn't add this, there's 20 seconds for you to uh, answer, uh, answer. So you have to be fairly quick. And by the way, the quicker you are, the higher your score. So you wanna read it as fast as you can, you wanna answer as fast as you can. So, so far we got LR as number one, Suad is number two, and Theo, you are number three. Serena and Safa, you are coming in at four and five, but this will change over time, depending upon if you get it right and how fast you get the answer. So we're gonna to go to the next question here. Remember the, 
in Inspire Sign 6 8, claim evidence or reason a two page spread. Where's it found? Every lesson at the end? Every module? Every lesson right after the lesson phenomena? At the end of the unit? I, I know I went over this towards the end. Where is that two page spread found? Every lesson right after the lesson phenomena. Now, if you're a K-5 teacher, it's one per module, but in middle school, it's right after every lesson, it's a two-page spread after the lesson phenomenon. Who do we have in front? Suad, you have number one. Mohammed, you are number two. Diana, you are number three. Followed by Maywish and Noir. Again, forgive me if I'm, I'm mispronouncing these words, uh, your names rather. Uh, number two, or next question, number three. Question number three. An adaptive personalized learning tool found in 6.8 is called. What do we call that adaptive personalized learning tool? I tried to show it, but I couldn't screen mirror it on my phone. It's only found in grades six through eight. Only found in grades six through eight. Learn Smart, 2.0 with Learn Smart. Absolutely right. Foldables is found in every grade, probes, STEM projects, every grade. Learn Smart 2.0 is the one found in grade six through eight. Suad is retaining the lead. Diana has moved up. Taz, uh, Taz name is in third, followed by Tuba and Lauren. And I think this may be the last four. That's question number four or five. I like to call the resource. What do I kind of tool do I call it? Now you better get this one because I, I went over this right here, right before this, uh, this uh, Kahoot. What do I call the resources tool? What's the name that I use for it? It is a filtering tool. The resources tool is a filtering tool. It allows you to filter down to find what you're looking for by keyword, location, or resource type. Let's see who's ahead now. Suwad is on fire, it says here. He's still number one, followed by Laura, Fatin, Safa, and Yasmin. Last question. See if Suwad can retain his, uh, the lead here. Question number five, last question. The formative assessment activity is designed to uncover misconceptions. You better all get this right. We covered a little bit. Paige Keeley probes, labs investigations, CCC or STEM projects. What are those formative assessment tools designed to uncover misconceptions? We spent a lot of time on these. Think chicken and egg, think mitten probe. Uh, oh, I may have said something, said too much there. If you said Paige Keeley probes, you are correct. Paige Keeley probes, every lesson begins with one. So who's on the podium here? Lauren is in third place. Lauren, you are a prize winner. Second place, Fatim. And third place, or first place, Uad, you are in first place for his Kahoot. Congratulations. Runner-ups, Razan and Saba, it looks like. I have some Paige Keeley books that I'm going to uh, send to Sarish and your, your Middle Eastern team to have sent to you uh, for this Kahoot quiz. I want to thank everybody for uh, this training. Thank you for staying on as long as we have been. We've been here for two hours and there's still stuff that I would like to talk about, like Learn Smart. Uh, so uh, thank you for being here. Hopefully you got something out of this session. Hopefully I shared a strategy that you might be able to utilize in your classroom. And if we need to do this again, we're here for you. Here for you. you adopt the McGraw-Hill program, we adopt you right back. And we want you to use it for its maximum effectiveness. So let us know how we can help. Absolutely. So, and Jason, I really loved the way that you ended the whole thing and wrapped it up into a Kahoot. It was so exciting to see that the answers come up and people participating. I mean, we it's 7 p.m. where I am, by the way, in Dubai, and we still have 140 people online ready to hear you. Thank you so much, Jason, for being with us. You bet, Sarisha, anytime. And thank you for our fantastic audience. Uh, you guys were amazing. Thank you. And congratulations, Saud, again.
Suad, oh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, um, thanks a million. Thank you, Mr. Jason. I just want to hang up here. I mean, hang on on this and just be like, if you have any questions for Jason, um, I do want to open the forum. Any questions at all? I do see there are two questions that have, and actually Jason already answered two of them because a few people wanted to know how Kahoot works. So we are done with that. But there are two questions on the Q&A box. Uh, Jason, would you want, do you want to pick them up or do you want me to read them? Yeah, could you read them for me? Of course I can. Uh, it's a question from Razan. He says, the pro part is clear for me, but I would like to get more strategies about how to help students in the claim evidence part. Oh boy, that's, uh, that's a good question. Claim evidence and reasoning is um, a framework that we've embedded within the program. Uh, every single module uh, in K-5 has it, every single lesson has it right after Engage. Now, I, I probably don't have time to go in, in any great depth today, but there are videos that support it uh, found online. I, you know, I would YouTube it. The, the, the challenge that most students have, just to give you a, a hint if you haven't used it before, the reasoning statement is the part where students are typically um, have the most challenges. They can make a claim, what they think about phenomena, what they think is going on. That's pretty intuitive for them, right? Uh, for our K-1 and uh, kindergarten and first grade students, they don't even have to create a claim on their own. They just circle which claim they think is best. Uh, students tend to be able to claim, collect evidence. That's pretty easy for them. The challenging part at the end is the reasoning statement. So my, the suggestion in the short amount of time I would have for you is to have a list of sentence starters that you can put on the board, have posted at all times, to get the reasoning statement started because most students don't know how to begin. You might say, um, I think, uh, let me see, like a, a, a claim might be, uh, is, um, you know, does air have mass? Okay, does air have mass? My claim might be, I think air has mass. And then your evidence might be, I think, but, but your reasoning statement, you want to connect the claim to evidence. So you you want to start with a sentence or a starter and give students choice of sentence starters to help them make that reasoning statement. Because the reasoning statement is the part where most students have the most difficulty. In the package that I'll send, just to follow up on this, in the package that I'm going to send as follow-up to Sarish, along with this PowerPoint and along with links. Oh, and by the way, Sarish, do you mind if I take the screen back just for a second? Yes, of course. Okay, okay. sorry about that. I have some sorry. links here. So uh, I just want to make sure teachers know these links that I'm about to share with you here. Uh, share here. So at the end of this presentation, I have some links. Um, alternative phenomena resources, okay? So all of these will be links in the PowerPoint that I sent for additional sources of phenomena. And again, phenomena should be done at the beginning of a lesson to spark curiosity. These are some really cool videos. We like ours, but if you think you could uh, find another one to extend it, use these links that will take you to different sources of phenomena. The second thing that I have here is a link on communication. So if you go, you know what, I'm just not, I'm not very good at getting students talking in my classroom and sharing their ideas. This link will take you to all sorts of other links videos and tutorials on how to get students talking uh, in your classroom. Thank you, Sarish. Sorry about that. I need to share that. No, no. I'm so glad you shared that. You know, it, it, and, and honestly, this has to be, Jason, my favorite Inspire Science session. I'm not oh, kidding. Right. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and no, you, you've done it in was... such an in-depth session, and I'm so grateful to you and our audience as well, uh, because this was really great. Thank you. And I will put some claim evidence and reasoning tools, some videos that I find helpful in the follow-up package that I'm going to send along with this PowerPoint. Fantastic. Thank you. Razan says, thank you for answering my question. Okay. There's another one by Nadira. It says, teaching the Inspire Science online is a big challenge. How could we give the most benefit of it, especially that there are lots of activities that require physical attendance? I think uh, this session probably came in early in the session, Jason. I, I think. Yeah. 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 I guess my suggestion would be, and this may not 
um, you know, be the complete answer to, to the challenge that you're having. You are right. Um, there are certain activities that require in-class uh, instruction. The inquiry activities come to mind. You know, they require resources. Students are not going to have at home. The, the, the STEM module project, they may not be able to do that at home. Some of the science challenges, they can because they may be a, an internet project or something like that. So some of them they can. But some of the STEM projects that might be engineering challenges, they just may not be able to do at home. That's true. They have to be in class. But there are some uh, things that can be done remotely. We talked about the inquiry rewind video. So instead of uh, students doing the hands-on activity, which is best, right? We always want students hands-on. You know, maybe remotely the next best thing is for them to watch it. Some might have the resources necessary to do it at home. Some might not, but everybody gets to watch the lab being performed and they'll still be able to experience it. I shared with you during the session, the phenomena videos. <clears throat> My best practice with the phenomena videos, as I've shared a couple of times, <clears throat> would be to assign, assign those remotely uh, and give students a specific ask, not just to watch the video, but to watch the video and come in with two questions or three questions that they have about that phenomena video, things that they are curious about or want to find out, or don't understand, just things that they come to the mind. Now they have time at home to think about it, process it, re-watch the video, watch it a third or fourth time, maybe ask a sibling, hey, what do you think about this? Or parent, what do you think about this? And now they're coming in with great questions. If I were to watch that phenomena video for the first time with my class in class, I can anticipate a lot of my class getting a little bit clammed up and you know, I don't know. And, now they don't want to share their idea. They don't have time to think about it. Maybe some might come up. Some of the quick thinkers may come up with a, a question, but a lot of them will remain silent. So assigning that phenomena video uh, ahead of time, that's a, that's a good best practice. Other best practices uh, is, is utilize the assessment tools. Uh, assign a pretest, okay? Uh, have students take it online. That will give you an idea of what area students are strong and weak. The pretest is a great tool to send students uh, remotely. The investigator articles, they're great to have students do at home, okay? The science paired, the, uh, the leveled readers, great activities for students at home. So I think outside of the inquiry and the labs and the STEM projects, I think you're gonna find a lot of, you know what, Suresh, I'm gonna share my screen again here. Um, because I'm thinking of something else here. Uh, you're going to find a lot of tools to, for students to do at homework. And there's something I, I, I think I have to mention. I go to grade four here. I did mention this earlier, and sometimes this gets overlooked by our customers. Um, so I go into course field. Let's go to a typical lesson. Okay? So inquiry preview, that's for me, the teacher. Inquiry Rewind, I could assign that remotely. In a probe, I could assign this remotely. Have students do this at home and come ready to talk about it in class. So just like the Phenomena video, if you want to integrate great technology, assign this remotely, okay? And have students share their ideas remotely. It looks just like the physical probe, okay? When I go to explore what I uh, and ex or explain, if you want students to do stuff remotely, we've broken down the lesson into chunks of content. And this sometimes gets misunderstood by teachers or they, 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 they just don't know exactly what these little chunks and explain are. This is essentially the narrative in the book, but instead of assigning the entire lesson, we've assigned, we've broken them down into segments that make them great homework assignments. So maybe I just want to drill in on this segment, how animals use their eyes. Okay. I could preview this as a teacher, take a look at it. Instead of being a whole big lesson, I just have four little pages. I've got a little bit of reading here. I have uh, a video embedded within here. That's kind of cool to have a homework assignment, a video embedded. Page three, what do I have on page three here? A little opportunity for response about what they thought about what they've seen and a little bit more reading. Perfect size homework. So something like this might be a perfect way to uh, 
to integrate the online experience in your classroom. How do I assign this? I just click assign, decide when I want it to be due. I'm gonna say read, watch the video, answer the question, and submit back to me. And I'm gonna make this worth 100 points. I'm gonna assign it to my class. Now that little homework assignment has been sent out to my class. If I go in as a student, what am I going to see? Well, let me go in as a student here. I've sent quite a bit on this uh, webinar over to my student. He's got a lot of homework waiting for him. I go in as Jim, one of my students. And I enter his fourth grade class, because that's what we've been working on today. Jim's going to see all of his to-do list, right? These are all the things that I assigned Jim during the course of this webinar. And here's that little read about I just assigned. Let's go. Let's take a look at it as Jim. Jim has this experience. This is what the K-5 experience looks like, by the way. Grades six through eight, your students are gonna see something that looks a little bit different. Uh, so I have that reading here, okay? Uh, I can watch the video here as a student, okay? Our eyes allow us to see some pretty spectacular things. And I can watch the video and then I can respond. Some Inspire Science teachers do a, a, another thing when assigning this homework. They tell students, hey, this is a really cool little tool. I want you to highlight the areas in this homework assignment that you're confused about. Those areas that you know you just don't understand by reading, okay? Just go ahead and highlight. So just let me know what that is. So let's say as a student, I come in here and you know what? I don't understand this section right here. Let me go and highlight this section for my teacher. I'm gonna highlight this blue, okay? So you give them that instruction to highlight those areas that they're confused about. Now I'm ready to turn this in and I've submitted it back to my teacher, okay? Now that homework assignment will show up in past work. And now when I go to home, I have only my to-do list. I love the to-do list in Inspire Science. Middle school, you have it as well. Students have a to-do list and then they have a past work section. I've already submitted that homework assignment. What do I see back as a teacher? Well, when I go back in as a teacher, and go into that assignment, uh, I can take a look at their assignments. Here's that read about it. Here's that student that submitted it. I have one student that submitted it. I take a look at Jim's work. I view that assignment. I'll be able to see the answers that he gave for this assignment, but I will also be able to see that highlighting. Ah, you're having trouble with that, huh? And uh, okay, I'm gonna make sure to spend uh, more time on that in tomorrow's lesson because you're telling me that. And not just one student, I'll be able to go from student to student to see their highlight. And if this content keeps coming up over and over again, if every student is highlighting this section, that tells me, you know what? I must not have covered it or I wasn't very good in class yesterday. I gotta got make sure I spend more time on it. So using that highlighting tool is really important. And I'm gonna give students, the student 100% on this because they did exactly what I asked them to do, highlight those areas that they're confused about. Uh, and so, uh, those are just a few suggestions. Uh, er, anything, just know this, anything in Inspire Science can be assigned digitally. I realize that some, like this inquiry activity, that's going to be hard for students to do outside of class. And if I go to the module level, uh, this performance task, they're going to need to be, they're going to need to be in class to do the STEM module project. Okay. So, so I, I understand that these are things that you just, you may not be able to do at home. If it's a science challenge, maybe, engineering challenge, probably not. But everything else in the lesson, I think is, is optimized for a remote environment because each one of these tiles makes a perfect little, except for this one, every one of these tiles makes a perfect little homework assignment. The probe, engage, and then all the way down here to evaluate where you might want to um, send a little quiz. Got a pre-made quiz waiting for you and evaluate. Let's open up evaluate, here it is. And here's that pre-made quiz that I could send digitally. Uh, that was a long answer, but uh, your answer sparked, uh, re reminded me that I forgot to kind of go over this. So if you're teaching remotely, Inspire Science is really, I, you know, I, I've, I've looked at a lot of programs out there for, for remote instruction, having homework in nice little segments like this that are assignable, Boy, that, that, comes, that comes in pretty handy. And every little activity, everything in the book, 
Every little bitty piece of the book is assignable in that way. Readers make great homework assignments. Don't forget those, as do those investigator articles. So keep, keep all of those things in mind uh, when using the program remotely. I'm glad you actually shared that, Jason. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. And I just want to remind everyone here that we this is the this session was specifically for Inspire Science program. But if you're using other McGraw Hill programs, then we do have separate sessions that are running. So if you're using the Reveal Math program, I know that because a lot of schools in UAE have um, two or three McGraw Hill programs. And so make sure you register for the other sessions. I think tomorrow is wonders. I'm just going to drop the link in the chat box where you can join us for other model session webinars. All you have to do is to select the session that you would like to attend and you will be given the registration link for that session uh, also the day of reminder and all of that so making sure you don't miss any of that session and thank you so much for being such an amazing audience with us i just want to let you know that this is the contact if you ever want to get in touch with us so thanks for joining us and you can drop us an email if you have any questions to right here at marketing.mia at mheducation.com or you can get in touch with our social channels which are on your screen right now but an email address just to make sure you know who to contact if you have any questions regarding the program or yes we will be sharing the recording of this session i know a lot of people want to have the recording i will be sending out an email that has the recording and the resources that uh, that jason was referring to um, and along you'll also get a certificate that's going to be in a separate email uh, for the session that you attended this uh, i was going to say morning but no <laughs> Morning for Jason, but thank you for attending the session. It's marketing at MEA, M-E-A at mheducation.com. It's goodbye for today from me and Jason. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much, Jason. That, that was really amazing. Thank you all. Uh, it's my pleasure to work with you all. Take care. Let us know how we can help. Yes, please. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. See you next time.